I want to welcome everybody to the lecture today, and it's on living well longer. Does it sound good to you, yes or no? Yes. Okay. My name is Debbie Moss. I'm on staff at Dawson as the Minister of Health and Wellness. It's my privilege to introduce you to this topic. As I had mentioned to a few, there's a lot of information to cover, and we're going to just touch the surface. But I hope that those of you that get an interest are feeling a little bit better and wanting to be a little bit stronger or functioning at a little bit higher level, that this will get you started on that journey and that you'll do some of the research yourself. But let's get started. I ask all of you to have your handout, your handouts ready, and your pen in hand because we're ready to, to do some rocking and rolling. I would love, my mother passed away last summer. She would have been 92. And she was functioning at a very beautiful level up until the last few months. I would love to live to be 90 and be high functioning, wouldn't you? But you've also seen friends and family that may live to an age and their functioning ability really decreased. And you kind of scratch your head and go, mm, I hope that's not me. So let's look at a few things. We're going to start. And I want to, to go over some things as we age, changes that happen. We're going to go over changes on the outside. Look around the room. Those of you that have known these people for a while, have they changed any on the outside? Look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. Have you changed any on the outside? Okay, changes on the outside. And it could be anything from your skin. It could be your hair. It could be your nails. It could be your teeth. And through our Healthy Lifestyle Program, I'm measuring people that, that say, I've changed in height. I'm not as tall as I was before. We can even change in height. Other things that change is maybe on the inside, and we'll talk about that. Do my muscles change? Do my bones change? Do my ears and its ability to hear change? Do my eyes change? Do my organs change? This will make a huge difference in our abilities and our functions. So we're going to go over each one of those step by step and touch on it. And you're going to want to ask a question on every one of them. But what I'm going to do is ask you to hold the questions. And so at the very end, we can discuss some things together, okay? So let's get started. <clears throat> let's start with the eyes. Now, uh, people look at their eyes, and has eyes changed over the years? Uh, it can. Can vision change over the year? Yes. And as we age, our acuity, our visual acuity begins to decline some. It slows down. We start producing less tears. Some of you probably would tell me, well, my complaint is my eyes are always dry. Anybody have dry eyes? And complain about that? The gel-like viscous that is going to be inside your eye begins to shrink. And so some of you may say, well, what does that mean? You might start developing float floaters. And you'll say, what is that, my eye? Oh, it's gone. No, it's back again. Oh, it's gone. And there's more of them. And it won't damage your eyes, but it is annoying. It is annoying. So you may see some of those things as time goes on. And some of you may have already had a lens that became very cloudy. And with that lens becoming cloudy, we call it a cataract, and it develops over there. You see the normal eye, the not so with the cataract because the colors changed. And it's become cloudy. Now, if the lights were low, you would see that this is really clouded out. And so when they would look at you, you're going to appear as if you have no wrinkles and that you're very fuzzy looking. You're going, that looks good to me. <laughs> but we've had many people take the cataract off and they go, I never knew my spouse aged that much. <laughs> so it's amazing how they, but a cataract, now, <clears throat> I have a cataract. I'm having it removed this next Monday. I'm asking all of you to pray for uh, that, that successful service surgery and a new lens put in. So because it got where the glasses could not even get a prescription strong enough, and that's one of the checkpoints, is when you have a cataract and it advances, and I would dare say half in this room have at least the beginnings, if not already, the progressions, or had one already uh, lens, new lens put in. But with that, <clears throat> I would dare say that some of you got to the point that your glass prescription did not help you anymore. And that's pretty much a telltale sign it's time. It's time. This morning I thought I'd put something directly, a drop on something, and I was about a quarter of an inch off, and I said, oh, it is time, because I had miscalculated that. So vision changes. Now, healthy lens, the cataract lens. The good news is this. The surgery takes 10 to 15 minutes if there's uncomplications in any of the procedures. They can now, oh, what a brand new decade, they can put in your prescription. Is that not the neatest thing? By and large, most 
most insurances will not pay for that. You'd have the, it pays for the nice clear lens and brand new, and that's good, but you might still have to wear your glasses. But there, there is some great new lenses out, so you have that conversation. When you need to have your cataract surgery, have that conversation because you may be someone that wore glasses that doesn't need them anymore or may only need them for reading or may only need them at one distance or another. So something to look at and something to consider. Other things with their eyes that may happen. After the age of 60, you're more prone to develop macular degeneration. It's age-related. Age-related is called dry. That's more commonly seen, less complications. The wet, we start worrying about. And you really have to be watched very carefully. Uh, in this, and the macular itself beginning to, uh, to deteriorate, what can I do and not do? Is it helpful uh, to go to the doctor? Yes or no? If you have macular degeneration, you should be going to your doctor minimal of every year. Now, what we're going to say for all of us, you are over the age of uh, 50 or 55 in here, most of you? I would say yes. And with that, it is recommended we go see our eye doctor every year. Okay, now that's the first thing. You're going to make sure if you're not doing that now, you need to start doing that because, y'all, if you mess up your eyes, that is something that's going to be a big regret. That's going to impact us in a lot of ways, whether you can drive or not drive, whether you can recognize family members or not, whether you can function safely at certain light as light changes. So please take care of your eyes every year. If you have either macular degeneration or glaucoma, you probably will be making more frequent visits, and that will be geared strictly by the doctor. He'll decide how to, and he'll be checking your pressure in your eyes and make sure. I always hate that puff of air, don't you? But what I know the disease can be, I take that puff of air every time I go in. And I'm of the age, it's checked every time. So be careful with that. Um, if you have dry eyes, most of the time the over-the-counter uh, just uh, tears can be helpful. But if you have dry eyes, we do encourage you to get an over-the-counter moisturizer because they don't need to stay dry and just you'd be irritated and say, oh, I'm so, my dry eyes are so dry, nothing I can do about it. But use those, but here's the key, make sure there's no preservative, no preservative in those artificial tears. You can get them from one to two dollars. It doesn't have to be necessarily a name brand, but make sure there's no preservative in there and use those drops. Another thing is with dry eyes, <coughs> Often as we get older, or if you're like me and you're on the computer some, or perhaps you're someone that loves to sit down and watch uh, Downton Abbey or uh, the Fox News Channel, whatever you might want to watch, the more that you fixate on either the computer or the TV, the less you blink. They actually, someone had done a study on this and timed how many times you blink. When you, and when you fixate either on TV or the computer, you do less blinking, more prone than to dry eyes. If you already have dry eyes, just imagine. So let me make another recommendation to you. If you are sitting down and you are watching a TV show, every commercial, you look away from the TV at a, a different distance. And you, you purposely just blink, rhythmically blink. Again, looking away, because the blinking is what produces more tears. Does everybody understand that? So what we're going to recommend is on the commercial. So here comes the commercial, and then you just look away. So from the distance, however far you're away, you're going to look at a different distance. Your brain and your eyes are refocusing, and you're going to blink. Now, the same rule goes with the computer. So commercials come on <clears throat> about every 20 to 25 minutes. So let's do a marker of every 30 minutes if you're on a computer, and I will bet there are people in here on a computer more than 30 minutes at a time. Am I right? So when you're at the computer, that's the 18-inch rule, but when you're at the computer, or if I am reading, and that novel's awesome, and I'm reading, and I've got, I'm fixated, page, page, and I never look up. 30-minute rule, after every 30 minutes on the computer, on this, you need to look at a different distance in the room and just blink, purposely blink. Everybody got it? So dry eyes, artificial tears, no preservatives. And put it in as you want. Use is not a limit on that. And then if you are someone who uh, uh, is, watches TV or is on the computer or enjoys reading every 30 minutes, look at a different distance. That's easy to do, isn't it? Another thing is, and I damaged my eyes with the sun. Now, I do mission trips, and a lot of them are in Africa. <clears throat> and I just didn't like to wear sunglasses. And <clears throat> my uh, cataract developed very quickly because of that. Now, uh, I know better, 
and I'm going to tell you what we need to do. And you bet I bought that pair of wrapper sunglasses now that I, every time I'm in the sun driving the car, ever I'm wearing them, but for years of damage. You can make a difference, at least in retarding the damage you and I may have already done. Not one of you in here should be out without having sunglasses. If you do not have a good pair of sunglasses or if you have glasses and want to just have something, but you need to cover and, and have a sunglasses on. So if you don't have, that's going to be on your checklist to do maybe this weekend. Get a good pair of sunglasses. Uh, for me, it happened to be prescription sunglasses because so much uh, I needed with bifocals. But for you, it may be just a cover that goes on your regular eyes. But please get your, uh, from it, it progresses your cataracts. It will progress and uh, damage even more if you have macular degeneration. And it will make your dry eyes even worse. So wear those sunglasses. So, okay, so, okay, blinking. Artificial tears, sunglasses. We're already on the road here, okay? And we're going to make sure, and if you're like me, I have to mark my calendar when I've had my last eye appointment. Now my, my eye specialist is good enough, he sends me a reminder. Okay, it's time. But other, before then, I always had to mark, and I'd go, did I go this year? I can't remember. You know, was it last year? What month did I go? So I'm sure some of you are like me. Make sure you do that. Okay, we're going to go quick. There's so much. Again, we could spend all day on the eyes, but we're going to pop on to... The teeth. And you go, oh my goodness, this is someone that is over 60 and they grind, they, they love ice, they love caffeine and coffee, and they love to smoke. And so with all of that, the teeth, now some of this aging uh, or yellowing of the teeth is just age. You know, if I put something out and let it, it's going to age. But some of it was environmental through the smoking and through the, uh, through the caffeine and coffee is real bad in doing that. Now, here all the chips in the teeth are some of the habits he had on what he would crunch and chew and love to get hard candy in his mouth. That may be someone in here. Someone in here may be an ice chewer and crack a tooth. One of the best foods for us is raw almonds, but it's one of the rough, uh, worst for cracking your teeth. So when you have to be really careful on what you chew and how you do it. So how often should I go and have my teeth cleaned? Every six months. So you mark that down. If you are not going, and I don't care if you don't have all your original teeth. You may have some that you've had to replace, store-bought, bought, dentures, whatever. You need to have, be checked every six months. Every six months. And they probably will do a cleaning. Now, if you have problem teeth, on this you may see better on your other sheet. But you will notice here all this plaque built up. And here the redness, and this person had gingivitis. You're going to have it more often as you get older. And is it because we don't take as good a care of our teeth? Or is it because, you know, we don't go to the dentist as often? We'll just fill in the blank. But you must floss. If you do not have floss, if you have never, I don't care if you are 90 years old, you need to start flossing. The floss is going to make a huge difference in the gingivitis. And that's one of the things every time I dental hygienist will say, are you flossing? Yes, I'm flossing. Are you flossing? So if you're not, I want you to write down there, I'm going to stop at Walmart or wherever. I'm going to buy me some dental floss. Most often, your dentist will give you some, get you started. Some like it wax, some doesn't. It's up to you know, whatever you and your dentist uh, thinks is going to be best for you. So, dental floss. How often should I do it? <laughs> you know, you need to do it after you eat. Now, I'm not going to recommend all of y'all flicking in here in just a minute. And what a lot of dental hygienists would say to you, if I'm in a program like this today and I wanted to make sure I got some of the bacteria out of my teeth, I didn't want to wait till I got home. Uh, you can get some sugar-free gum, and it is amazing how it will take out a lot of the food items. And a lot of dental hygienists are saying that now. If you're in an environment where you cannot floss, make sure you have sugar-free gum. Sugar-free gum in your purse or pocket. If you went, well, my purse is downstairs. If you had it in there, you would see I keep it in there. I have a little, so I'll know. Sometimes I just, it's not appropriate to floss, but I want to make sure because I don't want the food and the bacteria to build up on the teeth. Gingivitis, you can lose your teeth with that. So you want to be very, very careful. So again, set up your dental appointments every six months. Get them clean. And if you develop gingivitis and the teeth start pulling away from the gums, you'll want to probably, and they will probably tell you that you're going to need deep cleaning. And you want to preserve the teeth as long as you can. You want to preserve the teeth as long as you can. So, okay, let's go on. Do you hear what I hear? Okay. 
It's, it's amazing. <coughs> the way God designed us is so perfect and beautiful. <coughs> there are over 15,000 little tiny hairs that we start off with. Excuse me, just a minute. <coughs> And those can be damaged. And when they become damaged, you will not hear like you did to start with. <clears throat> what can damage you? Some of you men may have been in the war. And when you're around the, the high level of noise during war times, a lot of those hairs are damaged, cilia are damaged. Today, that's a huge, huge thing that happens when men come back is there's hearing loss. But you can have hearing loss if you have your own lawn company and it's your lawnmower and your weed eater and whatever. In fact, when I talked to an ENT about this, he said, Debbie, when you do your weed eating and it's only for an hour at a time, you need to have specialized covers for your ear. I would like to hear as long as I can because I love music. I love to hear the Dawson ears sing. I love music. I love the sound of laughter. I love to hear a baby cry. I don't want to miss out on anything. But to do that, I better start protecting my ears a little bit better because I would get out and just and do all this stuff and not really think about it. So I urge you, no matter what age you are, <clears throat> protect your ears if you're going to be around anything that's loud, equipment, and that sort of thing. As we age and as this, uh, as ears and the changes begin to happen, some of us may develop ringing in the ear, tinnitus, ringing in the ears. And that will affect our balance. Once it, it can get so severe that, you know, your equilibrium is off. So my ears not only help me with what I can hear you say, but also how well I can walk in my balance. It's going to be very important to keep them healthy. Another thing that might mess with our hearing, and I like this because this is pretty fixable. <clears throat> As you get older, there's dryness in a lot of places. There's also dryness in the wax of your ear. So when you do have wax and it's dry, it literally could plug. And so if you have a hearing loss and you're kind of wondering what's going on or if you're someone who likes hairspray uh, or if you have not had someone look in your ears you need to ask your doctor now what will happen a lot of us may have specialists and when you go to your GI doctor he may not care about looking in your ears all of us need a doctor that will really examine us head to toe when you go to your cardiac doctor he probably is not interested in looking to see if you have any wax in your ears or he may be but by and large, all of us need a doctor that can look at us head to toe and notice those subtle changes. Otherwise, we'll be going to 20 different specialists for every part of our body. But wouldn't it be great if we had, you know, someone that could look. Now, when they look in the ears, we want to see if there's wax buildup, and it can be extracted if there is. So remember, that is a problem as we age. It's not just for young people. Their wax is easy to get out because there's still moisture in it. It's harder to get out as we get older. So have, have someone look in your ears. Uh, someone had asked me, are there any herbs? And again, this is my disclaimer. I am not, or Dawson is not your physician or your clinic. And so things that I might say to you about vitamins and that sort of thing, I'm going to refer you to, the, to look up some of it yourself. But let me just mention this. There are some studies that are talking about certain formulas. There's something called uh, lipoflavoids or lipoflavoids. Lipo, however you want to pronounce it. <clears throat> that is a mixture of herbs for your hearing. It's specifically targeted for ringing in the ears. So anybody out there, other than me, that has ringing in the ears, you may, it's over the counter, and you can take it daily, and it has to be consistent and build up in your body. L-I-P-O, flavoids, F-L-A-V-O-I-D-S. A lot of vitamins that are in it. Uh, and I can write that down for you later. So again, for ringing in the ears. There's also a study that used, and they only called it advanced hearing formula. Now write this down, advanced hearing formula. And this doc's claim was that I'm putting together enough of these herbs, vitamins, that if you were to take it, it might improve some current hearing loss. Now, hearing loss that's caused from a damaged ear is one thing, but hearing loss that may be able to be tweaked one way or the other, it fascinated me. And so I wanted to see what was in it. And there are some things we, we know about. <clears throat> Ginkgo biloba is one that will help ringing in the ears. Well, it's in my formula for ringing in the ears. 
Uh, but there's other things like B vitamins and vitamin A. There's just things that we, you and I have heard of that are not dangerous that he has put together in a collection. So this is what I want you to do. I'm not saying if you have hearing loss, run out and start taking this, but rather advanced hearing formula. And I'm going to give you, uh, uh, you know, if you would, a, a challenge to look it up on the computer and see what's in it and what studies have shown to see if it's something that you might be interested in. And if you want to have conversation with me privately, I don't think it's appropriate for the group, but private, we'll talk about it. A lot of things in it. Uh, hearing aids, do you like them or not? Anybody in here have a hearing aid? Okay, are you wearing it today? Yes. Are you wearing yours? Are you wearing... <laughs> That's a joke, aren't you? Do you have your hearing aid on today? No. Okay, so, and this is what I'm hearing. A lot of people don't. A lot of people don't have their hearing aid on. So, and now, we won't know they work unless we wear them. But I'll tell you, all of them are not created equal or cost the same. Those of you that have shopped know it. And I, I pray for the day where insurance will pay for them. But right now, you've got to have some money in your pocket to get a good hearing aid. And, but I just wanted to mention, there, there's tons of styles. There are some that are, are big and go over the ear, and you've got all kind of contraptions with it that are easy on the hands to dial. There are some that go in the ear. There are some that are so teeny it goes in the ear canal, and you wouldn't even know someone has it in. There are some that are programmed that you have a little device, and when I change my setting, like I'm at dinner with you in a restaurant, and I, I know to dial it to a certain thing, and I don't have to take it out and do that, you know, I just dial it down here, very, but then I go to church where it's, ooh, here's the choir, the orchestra, that, you know, and then I need to dial it a different, so, but more expensive. But boy, do, you don't want to miss things when you want to hear. So anyway, so that's one thing to consider. So I would encourage you, if you have problems with hearing, don't just go, it's my age and that's it. Get tested. Get tested and see if there's a problem. When I started taking my formula for my ringing in the ears, it stopped. Now, it'll come back every time I forget a couple of days. It doesn't work for everybody. So in this, I challenge you, but get tested and they can tell you what might be the options for you if it, you're someone that would benefit from a hearing aid. I'd hate for you to miss anything. Now let's go quickly to the skin. Oh my gosh, how time flies when you're having fun. Now I'm sorry, this is someone that was famous when I was in my field days. Who is this? Uh, of course, no guy said that. It was only the women. Robert Redford. <laughs> now what I want you to look at, look at an earlier picture of him. Now, I want you to go through the changes. This is him as, as, as he's aging. Now, obviously, he has a hairdresser because his hair didn't change that much in color, and we know it has. But in his face of his shape, what has changed? Anybody? Th there is some, a difference in the shape, isn't it? The shape is different. And notice from there where it's a more pointed chin, look how it's squared off here. And it's not that he has gained a lot of weight. It's that this has changed here. We're going to look what happens. Now, well, Debbie, can I do something about that? You can spend quite a bit of money and do something about that. <laughs> those are things that functionally, will that make any difference really in your life? You, you know, th those are not a decision I'll make for you because someone in here already knows someone that has had work on their face. And there is some functional work. I knew one person that had uh, some functional work because the skin had sagged so much it interfered with their vision. So let's look at the next one. So we'll go with the women here. Does anybody know who this is? Just look at this side of the face. Yes. Uh -huh. And that is just a progression of what she could look like as she aged. And so we look at the difference. A youthful versus an aging face. We've already mentioned this squares off more because of the change in our skin and the texture. Now let, let's look at the skin changes alone and what's going to happen to you and I. The collagen that kept firmness, firmness, and firmness, we lose that as we age. That's, that's common with aging. So with that, our face, other areas will become less firm. Elastic, the ability to stretch and to go back into shape, it, uh, you begin to lose the elasticity. And it's not just in our skin. We lose that in our vessels elsewhere, too. 
but the elasticity will change. So when you were young and you, uh, women, you may have had a child and you got bigger and it went back and you were able to stretch and go back. Today, with less elasticity, if you gain weight and then lost it, that skin's just going to be there. It's different because we lose a lot of that elasticity. And then also, a, a younger face has so much more hydration in it. And if you probably have noticed, your skin is getting drier and drier. We we're less hydrated as far as at our skin level. So with those changes, we will age. Uh, blood vessels at the dermis level, uh, they will become more fragile. So you may see that you will bruise easily. And you go, I don't even remember hitting myself. The dermis is very shallow. And so you may, and, and often you'll see it in this part of the arms. So you may see that the skin will thin as you age. Now, y'all, all this is normal. What I would tell you is to, to make sure that you are more careful and bumping and moving around. But the issue of hydration, you need to really consider. Uh, I can't make my body be hydrated like a 20-year-old, but I can help it. And we lose our thirst gauge as we get older. Many of you in here, if I had you have to review what you drank this past week, a lot of you may go, I'm embarrassed. I haven't drank that much water. And we're going to talk about the important. Uh, your skin will also age because of the environment. Uh, for those of you that are stripped of your hormones, very natural process. Women through menopause and guys, we, we give it a name medically, but the changes that men go through and the change of their testosterone levels and other hormones. Uh, Water, water, water. The hair changes color for some. Not a, some of y'all have original hair color, don't you? <laughs> My sister-in-law said she's going to have that same hair color till the uh, till she's. <laughs> so, uh, but what happens as we age? The melanin is what puts color in our hair. That made me have my hair color, and it's changing now. As the melanin's changing in there, it's becoming gray. I hope it gets more whitish like my mother's was. It also begins, the, the hair follicles itself begin to get thinner. So your hair may look a little thinner or finer as it gets older. And then the follicle that every few months should spit out a new, brand new hair will decide not to do that as often. So it may be thinning hair. Not just finer, but thinning. Now, those are natural things. Now, you, there's a lot of stuff you can do about it if you want to. But those are types of things you can change your hairstyle. You know, you can have fun with that. It doesn't change functionality. Now, where would it may change the function is going to be, like I said, the elasticity in your eyelids. It can literally begin to stretch down so much that they, when you have your doctor's appointment annually at your eye specialist, they can measure the changes in your lids and literally can tell, is your vision bad enough now that we need to literally lift the lid back up? Now that is something that I would be an advocate for if it changed your vision, because I want your vision to be the best it can be. And those that do have the, now they gauge it, it's not the beginning sagging of it, it's going to be when it begins, and there's ways they measure that. And, and I've, I've known a, a two or three people that have had it done. They said, I cannot believe how much better I see because this flap has been reared up. I would encourage you, no matter how old I am now, and you, you need to moisturize your skin. And the best time to do it is while it's still damp. I did it wrong for 60 years. I waited, I dried off, and then I said, okay, oh, that's a dry spot, and I'd put it on then. Literally, before, while you're still moist, you should put your lotion on and it absorbs better. Okay, so start that if you're not doing it. I may be the only one in the room that was not doing that. Soap dries out your skin. So may I encourage you with your skin, it is better for you and I to use a, um, a moisturizer, moisturizing body wash rather than a dry soap. And um, now you, there's soaps that have moisturizer in it, but there's something about the body wash and the moisturizer that will hold it in better. So, so if you get that, I'm not recommending a certain brand, but moisturizing body wash, and then that way you can build in moisture actually while you're in the shower and to hold it in. Uh, I'm not going to do a check of your legs today, but I bet if I had, let me see your legs. I want to see how dry they are. I bet some of you would go, oh, no, <laughs> because our skin does dry out, doesn't it? Okay? It's not just our face, it's not just our hands, but it's our legs, it's our heels, it's our feet. So we really need to do it. So get the moisturizer and, and do that. And then uh, it's not too late to use some sunscreen. We've already damaged our skin over the years. And we'll develop some skin damage areas that may have to be removed. 
but we can protect it a little bit by adding the sunscreen now. If you're out in the sun, you should have some sunscreen on. So, um, so moisturize, moisturize, moisturizer. And then some of this, I'm just accepting that my face is becoming more squared. I look at my picture and I go, that's a different shape. That's okay. <clears throat> so, but I want to keep an eye on and make sure that it doesn't impair my vision <clears throat> and some other things, okay? But it's interesting. Uh, <clears throat> sometime within a week, get a picture of you today and get a picture of you when you were 20 and look at the difference in the shape of your face. It's, it's really fascinating. Okay, I want to look at this next one just very quickly. <clears throat> Many of you may have arthritis. I have it in my knees, damaged knees, playing sports for years and just, just living life crazy. And uh, so they hurt. I can tell you 48 hours when it's about to rain. But I can still function. There may be a time. Now, uh, I, alter what, I alter how I do certain things. When I work in my garden or in my flower bed, I wear knee pads now because, doggone it, I've about worn them out, the pads that I naturally have in my knee. So I, because I still want to function. There'll come a time I may have to have one replaced. Anybody here have replaced joints? Anybody? A couple, I bet do. So my brother got his knee replaced and went from a sports injury years ago, but it got where it changed his, he says, I want to be able to run and play with my grandkids. And he's still a young, well, by standards, a younger man. And so he says, I, to do that, I'm going to have to get a better joint. So don't be surprised if sometime during your life you have to have a joint replaced. But if it messes, now this in itself may not hurt you. You may still be able to grab a jar, open that peanut butter. You may be able to tilt tie your shoe. But if you de begin developing these nodules or the joint begins swelling too much, you may then have a challenge opening up jars. You may have a challenge. Now, there's medicines that can help you. But there's someone in our church that within the last year had a joint replaced because of arthritic joint. And it can help the function. So be aware that there's something to do. Don't go to the point that your function has changed and you've limited activities if it can be replaced and do successfully. And be careful of the medicines that you do have. Other things that can happen, our nails don't grow as fast as we get older. And you go, oh, I like that. Do yours go? Well, that's good. Typically, as we age, our nails slow down their growth. It's unusual because our nose may still grow. <laughs> our earlobes may still grow. Now, again, if you had a picture of your husband's earlobes when he was 20 and his earlobes today and if he's 70, it's going to be a different length. Isn't that fun? But nails slow down. Now, what I wanted, toenails may get hard and thick and brittle. You may get lengthwise ridges in them. One thing to talk to your doctor about. And again, you may go in there, he listens to your heart and blood pressure, you look good, any complaints, bye-bye. And uh, get your next appointment when you, as you go out. Ask him, would you mind looking at my nails? Look at your toenails. Look at your fingernails. The fingernails may be obvious. When you go in there, make sure the polish is off. Because he needs to see the color of your nails. Is it yellowing? Is it uh, thickening? Do you have a fungus developing? Do you have a thickening of the nail and it's more of a different color because you have circulation in your legs that is compromised and it will make your nails get thicker? Now that's different than the thickness because of fungus. Now I'm gonna, that is my promo for the foot doctor. So you bring those feet in here in April and, and when you not only look at your feet, go, would you mind looking at my nails too? Because you want to know, why has your nails changed? Because it can be indicative of some problems. You'll live with the fungus. You may not like it. But if, this, if it's showing that you're having compromised circulation, they may want to take a look at something else as well. So take a look at that. Also, the ridges that can come up in nails can be a sign of a nutrition deficit. Also, an iron deficit. But you know, again, if I'm your physician, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the big picture, your heart, your lungs, and the stethoscope may graze the, the body, but you want to look at the details and stuff, okay? So we're going to look at that. Okay, some of you <coughs> may say you got shorter. Some of you, your gait may change. Uh, I've heard that, uh, that women will lose uh, 
anywhere from two to three inches, and men a couple of inches, a little bit less than women. And so don't be surprised or shocked. There is, there is change as we get older. There is changes because these spaces here, they become deteriorated. And so they, what would have been this space will get a little smaller because it's deteriorating. Wear and tear, wear and tear, wear and tear. Okay, and then your bones may become a little bit more brittle. But look at the difference in the shape. As this person's uh, osteoporosis, which means their bones became more porous and thinner, look how their posture changed. And the Dowinger's hump is what we call when someone literally, th their spine has curved so much that they're developing a hump in their back. Now, we can do something at this stage we can work on our postures, we can get on medications, we can get calcium supplement, we can do things. But when we develop the downs or hump, it cannot be reversed. So look at yourself in the mirror or tell a loved one, look at me, and how's my posture? Because sometimes it's hard to tell ourselves, isn't it? And we should be having uh, our bone density checked. You are of at the age it should be checked. They, my mother had osteoporosis. So boy, they got me in there and they checked me every other year. And my insurance, and I believe Medicare, will pay for every other year, not every year, unless you have a very, very advanced case. Osteopenia means a little bit less than it needs to be. Osteoporosis is you have full disease process. Now, also, as you develop some of this, your gait may change. You may want to notice your loved one. Are they walking strongly, heel toe, and just not wavering at all as they walk? Or are they having a wider gait and shuffling a little bit because they're unsure of their balance? May not be that slow, but watch and see uh, as gait changes. Of course, I see so many people in this church, and I will watch them over the years and watch how their gait changes. Their gait change may be because their knee, they feel so unstable with their knee. And so what they'll do is they'll seem to give in a little bit. They're not limping, but they're so afraid they're going to fall. So careful on the gate, so be aware of that. This next one just shows how this, it becomes so much more porous. And we get, now when it gets so bad, what you're going to see happening is you can break uh, a rib, uh, your back so easily. You can break your hip so easily. And all of us know someone. From the age of 30 to 70, you lose about an inch and, but, uh, in men and from uh, women lose from age 30 to 70 as much to two inches. So if anybody here is 70, you could have lost up to two inches. Now if you haven't, that's good. You're, you're trying to take good care of your bones. And the cartilage between the joints become worn out and that's why sometimes the posture change. Now as you wear out uh, your knees and the padding there, you'll find the knee that it's worse is going to start looking bowed and you're going, I never had bowed legs. And we've seen people that if it's in one leg, one side will seem bowed and one not. Or you'll see someone as they get older, you go, they look like they just got off the ranch of a horse. And they're bow-legged. And they may say, you know, when I got married, I wasn't bow-legged. But it's because it's deteriorating. And often with deterioration, the bones will go out like this. And that's when you start feeling those pain because the bone's on the bone. So be aware of that. Now, what can you and I do? Now, this is someone stretching. Not necessarily this particular stretch. One of the functional problems you and I have as we get over, we become less flexible because our connective tissue changes, our muscles change, and uh, we need to stay flexible. Now, the church has done a great job at the FRC. They have classes that are geared for you and I, and they have two or three teachers that are great with it. I urge you, and it is not too late. Several in here I know that are in the class. They help work with your balance, and they help work with your strength and your flexibility. And all of these are needed because there's probably more than half of you that when you get out of the bed in the morning, your first three steps are, oh, 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 and then you work it out a little bit. Your ankles may be stiff, your knees may be stiff, your back may be stiff, and you have to work it out. So I urge you, it is not too late to increase your flexibility and your strength. One of the reasons that people have trouble with muscle loss as they age is the amount of protein they take in. Uh, now these are just some simple weights that people have. And can you imagine, this lady actually looks like she's having fun with it. But uh, sometimes as we age, we, 
it's, it's inconvenient to cook. And if you're a widow or a widower, you may not want to <coughs> spend a lot of time in the kitchen. So you may have a cereal for breakfast and just, uh, you know, a lot of carbs. Or you may just get something real quick for lunch and not much protein. And when we're not having adequate protein, you're already going to have less muscle mass as you and I age. You'll notice your muscles seem to have atrophied. And some of it's going to be your diet change. And some of it's going to be... Uh, of age because as, as you and I age, the muscle itself, as it becomes drier, is going to be filling up with a little fat. So we want to be really careful with that. I urge you, I urge you to, uh, to do walking and to be active. Okay, I'm going to have to jump through all these real quick. The lungs, <clears throat> God's, uh, boy, again, the design of this is just so spectacular. Um, as the bones change, the rib cage may become a little bit smaller, which makes that what? Harder to get the full breath you may have had when you were 20 and playing sports. The muscle that supported the diaphragm that allowed you to take a deep breath. And would you do that with me? I want you to see if you can breathe through your nose. And I'm going to hold it and see on, uh, and follow the directions and see if you can do this. Breathe in through your nose. I want it full let's make, and hold it. And you're going, I can't do it. Hold it. Now out through your mouth. And almost where you push it out. You should do that three times very slowly and make yourself fill up your lungs because as we age, the rib cage again, it just doesn't seem to want to be as pliable and the diaphragm loses its ability to take that deeper breath. And the more you practice, the better it'll get. Why do I worry about that? As I age, my immunity changes. My immunity is not going to be as good as I get older. And that would make me more prone, and you'll hear more people over city getting pneumonia, getting bronchitis. This past season was horrible with that, wasn't it? Uh, we had uh, flu, upper respiratory problems, bronchitis, pneumonias in our church like crazy. And we need to practice that. Don't wait till you get that respiratory infection and go, oh, Debbie said take some deep breaths. You need to be doing that now, filling up the lungs and doing it. <clears throat> Nerves in our airway that trigger coughing. They're not as sensitive as we get past 60. So we're not able to produce the phlegm that we really needs to move. Uh, so uh, particles seem to collect up in the lungs more. Thus, we result in disease. Immune system gets weaker and uh, less apt to fight infection. So I'm a proponent to get your flu vaccine every year. I'm a proponent that to get a pneumonia shot if you haven't already gotten it. And the new one that's out that came out uh, few months ago that to get that as well. I, I got my first pneumonia shot uh, when I turned 60 recently. But the new vaccine came out and they said I need to wait to get that for six months because it is a different coverage. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so uh, be aware of that. And then also other things, I mean, your immunity, why is it more uh, uh, senior adults get shingles than a 20 year old? So do I recommend, read the literature, your doctor will probably even recommend to consider the shingles vaccine. So again, these are things to have conversation with your doctor about, to have conversation. If you've ever had shingles, you never want to have it again. I'm going to quickly go through this. Uh, looking at the time, I'm going to go like crazy. Are y'all ready? Fasten your seatbelt because we're going to strip a gear here. Uh, as you age, as you age, <clears throat> Uh, it's not uncommon to start having a blockage. You may never have a heart attack. You may never have angina, which is just a temporary uh, episode where you didn't quite get enough oxygen to your heart. And it felt like a heart attack, but then you're better because you relax. So let's take a look. This can happen over time, a blockage. When the artery wall, and again, it's less elastic now. It doesn't stretch even the artery like it used to. And it gets where it's sticky. Do you know what I mean by flypaper? that you put out uh, outside. We used to do that all the time. And what it'll do, it'll ca collect particles like your fats and LDL that would go through usually. It's going to collect up against the wall. Oh my gosh, it's getting worse and worse. Now the blood that I would love to flow through is not going through freely. And all I need to do is have one little area of plaque that develops, break off in a blood clot form, and now in that artery, there's no way the blood can go through, and you can have a heart attack. So that's what we're seeing here. You, all of us know someone who's experienced a heart attack. Some of us may even know someone who's had to have a little bit of a spring put in there. We call a stent. It's one thing to go in there 
And then we open up the artery. We put this balloon, open it up, and then you can go in there and you put the spring to help it stay open. Isn't it cool what's happened over the years? They didn't have those when I first started in cardiology 30-something years ago. And then they developed these angioplasties. Then they developed these stents. And now they can coat it with medication to even help it not collect up inside the stent. A lot of neat things. But if you stay at home with your angina and wait and wait and wait and have your big heart attack, then there's going to be less help they can give you. Know the symptoms of a heart attack. I would love for, uh, for you not to have that problem. But also in the heart, we have valves that open and close with the flow of blood. As we get older, they get stiff. And when I listen to you, that's what I would hear and call a murmur. So those happens with aging too. Some of you may already have those. We've also with, uh, with our heart, and y'all, I've got one heart. I want to take good care of it. There's some things I, I have double of, and if I lose one, I still can keep on going. The heart is important. Now, with this area, and this shows that there, there are also some other things that go on. The rhythm of my heart may change as I get older because if the aorta is not opening, if my vessels and arteries are starting to collect up, then literally the rhythm, you've heard of an ECG or an EKG, that is where they take a picture at the electrical activity of your heart, and it can change as we get older. Very important. Atrial fib is more common in those as we age, and it is not a benign condition. It is something that the doctor needs to look at and decide if you need to be treated. Now, one thing I made in my notes is sometimes as we get older and we own a medicine, oh, now I'm on another medicine, oops, I'm on the third medicine, <clears throat> the medicines cause some side effects. And sometimes you say, I feel worse, doctor, on the medicines you put me on than, than I had when you said I had the problem. I'm feeling worse. It's sure not helping me. Now, it may show evidence in a test that it's improved, but you don't want to feel horrible. You want to feel better and have it improve. So the only way that, uh, that the doctor's going to make other changes, you've got to communicate with your doctor and let him know. If I'm put on a blood pressure medicine and I'm getting very dizzy with it and I'm having trouble when I have uh, uh, changes in my posture uh, and my blood pressure takes a drop when I change uh, postures, I need to let my doctor know that because there's several classes of drugs for blood pressure and they can switch that and not, me not have the symptoms. Uh, it may be something that they'll say something about the sodium I'm taking. It may be something else. So please communicate to your doctor. Uh, as we get older, it is more people with long-term hypertension that may develop congestive heart failure. And that is very challenging, and that will be a problem. Uh, um, again, as the vessels may block, now remember, I have vessels from head to toe. As the vessels block, it can block up in my neck as well, can't it? And when they block here, what's it going to impact? And so people may first have small symptoms of a TIA, but when it totally interferes and I'm not getting blood to my brain, uh, that is a stroke. Now, the, the way they identify a stroke is that you have the symptoms of a TIA. Of course, you know that involves speech and, and motor skills and other things. But it has to not go away for 24 hours. I'm not going to sit at home with a family member 24 hours and go, mm, it's not a stroke yet. We need to wait 10 more minutes because all of that damage. In fact, I hate the definition of it. If you have symptoms of a TIA, you need to treat it as if it's a stroke and go uh, immediately to the emergency room because I want it interrupted. We had some, a church member a few years ago that had symptoms of that here. And we called immediately, got them in, and then one of the things we do is we time it. Because if within three hours you get them to a place that they can get a medication, you literally can burst open uh, if it's a clot and hopefully open it back up and all the blood flow is restored. We timed it, got them there within 45 minutes from the time they started to the time they got in to the time they tested to the time they got their medicine. And immediately all symptoms resolved conversation return, absolutely no residual effect. And the key is this. I didn't say, well, you need to wait because we don't know really what this is yet. Any symptoms of, that are stroke-like, you don't determine if it's a TIA or not. Always let the doctor do that. Very important. 911. Uh, can I click through these quickly? GI. Anybody in here ever had a colonoscopy? 
every hand should go up. <laughs> so, so on this, how important is our GI tract does change as we as we get older, and and some of the things that can change with it, you can have uh, uh, these little pockets develop, and that in itself will not kill you, but you get those areas inflamed and you think you've died because of pain and suffering that come with it. Now, what are things in our GI tract? Polyps can develop. That's why the colonoscopies are so important. Polyps and the risk over 50 is, is higher. One half of those over 60, several in here would probably have diverticular disease. And so, and with that, you don't, those weakened pouches that happen, you do not want bacteria, food, and other things to collect in there and become inflamed or infected. Pockets can become inflamed. Uh, the reason you want the colonoscopy or a sigmoidoscopy you can have more often because it's flexible. The colonoscopy is a little bit more thorough, but the, with, the, uh, with the test, colonoscopy, if it is cleaned at age 50, meaning no polyps, uh, no abnormal growth, they may have you wait several years. But if there's any evidence, they're going to have you come back sooner. The thing that's important about getting one at 50, you've got a good baseline. Because if I have a growth there, a polyp, they're able while they're in there to snip it and biopsy it. They, I have heard reports, it's in the 90 percentile of those that have, uh, have had colon cancer, that if they had maybe gotten their colonoscopies earlier and they could have gotten rid of some of the disease process, it may have delayed or even prevented. And so I urge you, if you hadn't had the colonoscopy, you, you need to call and get that scheduled because it could literally prevent the problem by clipping that out. Uh, things that do get worse as we get older with the GI tract, there is more constipation. There is. Remember the same dryness that happens? It happens in our GI tract with the enzymes. So you will have more people. It's not that just when we get over 60 we complain. It's because we, we truly do have more problems with the constipation. It's going to be important that you eat fiber. It's going to be important that you drink water. Uh, digestive contractions, because when I eat, uh, the tract will actually uh, uh, contract and move all of the process down till it's finally evacuated. As you and I get older, those contractions are not as effective. Another reason we have constipation. I mean, it, we have reasons in that. Medications that you and I may have been put on may make you constipated. So another reason, inactivity. And those over 60 seem to slow down. I don't want you to. You're going to go over to the FRC and start doing an exercise class. But as you become more inactive, you're going to be more constipated as part of it. And the less fluids. Remember, you lost your thirst gauge. I'm going to remind you of uh, with the water bottle. And again, if you want one when you leave. But I'm going to challenge you with this. There's so much I want to tell y'all. Can you give me five more minutes? And if you need to leave, I understand. The, uh, all water is not created equal. And Dr. Richard Cooey came here three years ago, and he did a brilliant job in explaining to us the difference in the pH of water. Uh, normal pH of water is 7, okay? I'm not trying to make you a scientist. But if it's less than 7, it becomes acidic. And we know when our body is acidic, it becomes more inflammation. What does that mean? More joint pain, more aches and muscle ach aches and pains. It also means more prone to disease. When I am more acidic, more chance of heart disease, more chance of diabetes. So I want my body to be more alkaline and it is uh, almost a treatment form. Now with that I want to know well, how, what can I do with my water to make it more alkaline? You could put some baking soda in it. <laughs> you could. But the easiest thing is a lemon. It sounds counter, counter <coughs> to what you'd want to accomplish putting lemon in water. But lemon actually the way the osmosis goes will make it when you drink it make your body more alkaline. So what you've done, perhaps sometimes in the restaurants, was very much good to do all the time. It needs to be a fresh lemon that has not been exposed to the air or oxygen uh, for more than 30 minutes, which means you need to buy a bag of lemons, okay? And just cut it and then just get it out, squeeze it in, good to go. And uh, that will allow you to increase the pH, and it's something that would be great. Now, I'm encouraging you to drink more water unless you have kidney disease. I don't know all of your histories in here, so I don't know. If you have kidney disease, you may be under fluid restriction. And, but if not, your kidneys as they get older, as your kidneys get older, uh, you do not tolerate too much fluid and you don't tolerate too little fluid. 
As you get older and with your kidneys, you get UTIs a lot more often. And you will get a bladder infection more often. So I urge you to drink enough water. But if you have kidney disease, make sure that the doctor then tells you, I don't want you to drink more than such and such. If you don't, then 64 ounces of water is great and less of the other junk. And you and I should not have soft drinks at all. Are you hearing me? At all. It doesn't matter. Sugar, no sugar at all. It's better for us. If you have diabetes, uh, it needs to be screened even more often. Uh, with memory issues, <laughs> let me just quickly say a couple of things. Y'all, it's not normal to have dementia. It's not normal to have Alzheimer's. That's not a, a, a normal part of getting older. Our brain does change because there is some shrinkage and there is some uh, uh, plaques that can build up, and so we can have changes, but it's a disease. It's not normal. So how doctors word it sometimes bothers me. That is not a normal part of aging. Uh, when you age, you still should be able to focus attention to be able to manipulate information. Like if I said something to you, you should be able to think through that without having to you know, sort for very long. You should be able to store information and that may be failing for some in here. And it, you should be able to be able to respond with just in a few seconds. I'm going to, let me do a quick thing here. Get your pen. I'm going to ask you something real quick. I will say something. I want you to write it down. And uh, do not ask if you did not hear it. I'm going to say it loud. Mm -hmm. I will say it only one time. And th the test is going to be, can you process it and put it down quickly? Can you process it and put it down quickly? It's going to be a challenge for some of you here. Okay, here's a, and don't look on anybody's paper. If you didn't get it, go to the next one. Write down what year this is. Write it down. Write down what season this is. Write it down. Write down what date that is. That's the number, the date of today. Don't look at your what. I saw that. Uh, write down what is the day of the week. Write down what month this is. Write down what state you're in. Write down what county you're in. Write down what this building is. Okay, special question. What room number is this? Some of you will know. I'm going to say three words. Do not write these down. Hair. Don't write this down. Car. Apple. <laughs> okay. There is a word, world. World. Around the world. Don't write it down. Around the world. Do not write this word down. World. Now, what I want you to write down is I want you to be able to spell that word backwards. Spell word backwards. Now, don't write it down and then just switch it around. I want you to, in your head, that means you have to do it in your head and then put it down. Frustrating, isn't it? What were the three words I asked you? Okay. And some may have been a little slow. Anyway, there's all sorts of things. That, and now, if time allowed, I would draw one design up there, and then I would ask you to look at it, to turn back this way, and to draw it down. So these are activities, y'all, that help our memory. And things that s seem to be pretty simple to do. Is it true if I, if I don't use it, I lose it? You know, and some things we can think about. I'm going to go through a quick list, write down these things. As I get older, there's going to be change in estrogen, testosterone, some thyroid, some cortisol level. All of these will impact how you feel. All of those have conversation with your doctor about. You hear me? Now, irregardless, if you do not want to be on hormone replacement, 
the symptoms that come along with that, be aware of what they are. For men that have a, you know, a plummeting testosterone level, have conversation with your doctors. Some of the issues might be important to talk about. Men, if you live long enough, your prostate's going to get large. And why does that even matter if it's not cancer? Because of where the, the, the flow goes of urine out your body is surrounded by the prostate gland. So every man, if you live long enough, may have problems with enlarged prostate, benign hypertrophy. Not cancer maybe, but with that, you may have symptoms of urgency. Got to go to the bathroom quick, cannot hold it. Change in posture. I will watch, now this is the nurse in me, where a man is sitting down and for an hour, maybe had coffee at Sunday school, then stood up for the invitation, and then it's all, you can tell it's frantic, and then the rush to the bathroom. Because postural change will do that as well. Women, mm -hmm. now we anatomically are different, but some of the same things will happen. Have conversation with their doctors. There are either procedures or medications that can help with a lot of the symptoms. Don't suffer when there are things that can be treated with that. Every one of us in here over 50 should be on a multivitamin. If you're not, I, when you go to check on these other things that you're going to check on, would you ask your pharmacist what would be a good one? And I would say for those that are silver-haired, but again, over 50. There are some different trace minerals that you and I over 50 need to have because they naturally become uh, and I'm telling you, it makes a difference, multivitamin. Have conversation with your doctor about vitamin D. And I don't mean just what's in my multivitamin. Many seniors lose that, and I'm outside a lot. But because I'm getting older, my skin does not absorb the vitamin D it did when I was 20. Well, you look like you got some sun. It still doesn't mean the vitamin D has been absorbed. Are you following me? And so when I went to an endocrinologist and chatted with him, he said, Debbie, I want you to take two grams of vitamin D in addition to your multivitamin because I'm older. Vitamin D helps with issues up here and a lot of other things. But I'm not telling you for you to take it. I'm telling you, you need to have conversation with your doctor. Would it be okay to do that? It helps you absorb calcium as well. Do you have adequate potassium, magnesium, and calcium in your body? This is what you need to talk with your doctor about. And that level should be drawn. Every time I go, they draw that for me. Because if either one of those are low, my heart will not beat regular. I will not have the muscle uh, strength that I need to. And I'll, I'll have fatigue in muscles earlier. Potassium, magnesium, calcium. Is that checked in you? Ask your doctor about it. Know your numbers. Lab work, blood pressure, know your numbers. Ask if it would be wise for you to have a B-complex. Most people with a heart attack have an elevated homocysteine level. You're going, so what? Homocysteine levels are decreased with B vitamins. I'm just telling you. So, ask your doctor, <coughs> as I get older, what would you think about me? I'm not telling you to go take it. But have conversation with your doctor or your pharmacist about B-complex. Have conversation with them about CoQ10. If you're taking a lipid-lowering drug, a statin, there's many names of these, but a lipid to lower your cholesterol, I'm surprised if they haven't put you on CoQ10 because most statin-lowering drugs decreases your coenzyme 10, and that will cause you fatigue, that you're not able to do physical functionability as well, and it needs to be replaced. CoQ10, so ask them about that. Some athletes take it anyway because it improves uh, exercise performance, so it's not an unusual thing. Uh, consider if you have an exposure to, uh, to a cold, flu, or whatever, consider vitamin C and echinacea. Consider it. And you may want to talk to a pharmacist about that. Vitamin C and echinacea can help uh, stunt, if you will, some symptoms. Your body temperature changes as you get above six, age 60 because the fat pads change. So don't be surprised if the person sitting next to you at church is in layers. That's okay. That's a normal process. So I don't worry or fret about that. I just tell people, if you're one that does chill easily now, just dress in layers. 
I'm going to encourage every one of you, if you're on a medication, which I suspect you are, you write them down, you take them to your pharmacist, and you understand what every one of them is, and also make sure that they haven't. Because if you're going to more than one doctor, they could be bumping heads with each other, the, the medicines. And I've seen too many people at our church that when they did a correct tweaking of the medicine, oh my gosh, they felt better. So I urge you, write down every one, go to your pharmacist and let him review them. And he may go, same doctor ordered these? Because often a doctor ordered this and this doctor ordered this. And then here's your result. And know that and keep it in your bill phone so that if you and I have to go to the doctor one day or the emergency room, we'll have that to show them. Find a reason, y'all, to have humor in your life. Humor. And I don't care how old I get, I've got to have a reason to laugh. And God designed us that way. And you realize that when I laugh, there are chemicals that are naturally excreted and circulate when I laugh. It's called a mirth laughter. When you give that belly laugh, and let me tell you, if you don't have a reason to laugh, we need to, get, uh, we need to find some reasons. Because God designed us that way, and don't you think he intended us to live that way? I would think yes. You need to keep social contacts. I cannot tell you how many people over the age of 60 pull back. And you need to have, and it's, uh, it's been recommended, at least five people that you can call on. Contacts, social contacts. So how often do I go to the dentist? Six months, put it on your calendar. How often should you go for a full physical where they're going to head to toe you? Once a, Once a year. How often should you get a colonoscopy? When should you get your first one? Age 50, unless there's a history in your family and it's even earlier. But they stop taking the, they stop giving those after 75. Well, and there's, it, it depends on what your history is. Everything depends on your history. And let me also say, now, you understand about the water? pH and everything. Let me let me say this, and y'all, there's so much, and I would love personal conversation with anybody that's interested about any of this stuff that's of interest to you. But let me, the probably the most important thing to stay healthy. Your your soul needs to be healthy, and I can I can keep my heart in shape. I can keep my lungs breathing well. Boy, I can keep my joints going. But if my soul is not healthy, the results are, are devastating. So may I urge you, keep that soul healthy, and you, you're in a good place for that to happen. Uh, and then, let, because of time, we need to close, because I know some need to return to work. Some of these issues, such as how much protein should a senior citizen be eating a day to maintain muscle mass and not lose it, that's a, that is a lecture. But also, if you're interested in that, I'll talk to you privately. Is there exercises that I could be doing at home right now if I'm unable to go to class? And there is. And I could talk to you privately. So if any of this is of personal interest to you, would you talk to me and call me? Only Debbie on staff, so it's real easy to call and say, Debbie. But I want to thank you for your attention today and your time. I want to look out in the audience and see some healthy people that can hear and see and speak. And I, I pray that you will find joy for the life that you're living, okay? Thank you so much for being here today.